BBC World Service, this is Ritul Ashar with The Real Story. And this week we're looking at the virus that is fake news. Is the rapid spread of distorted facts and baseless lies corroding trust and damaging democracy? If the media's job is to be honest and tell the truth, then I think we would all agree the media deserves a very, very big, fat, failing grade. You know, we call it the fake news. Not all of them. Do you notice now they're using, everybody's using the word fake news. Where did you hear it first, folks? Well, when you, when you report fake news, no. When you report fake news, which CNN does a lot, you are the enemy of the people. Go ahead. Mr. President. Fake news, one of Donald Trump's favorite phrases for belittling his opponents. But what is it? Well, the experts prefer to talk about misinformation and disinformation. But what's the distinction and why is what ha is happening now any different from the propaganda campaigns that have been deployed for centuries? We'll examine the role of technology, which has helped us to connect, but also to share almost anything we think is interesting, regardless of its basis in truth. And we'll discuss whether it's states, individuals, corporations or algorithms that are powering the merry-go-round of disinformation to spin at a dizzying pace. So let's meet this week's panel. Petras Ostravikas is a Lithuanian MEP and the co-author of a report presented to the European Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee to strengthen counter-propaganda measures. Carl Miller is the author of Death of the Gods, the New Global Power Grab. He's the research director of the Centre for the Analysis of Social Media at the think tank Demos. Susan McGregor is assist assistant professor and assistant director at the Tau Centre for Digital Journalism at the Columbia School of Journalism in New York. And also in New York, we're joined by Claire Wardle, the executive director of First Draft, which is dedicated to finding solutions to the challenges associated with trust and truth in the digital age. Welcome to you all. Claire Wardle, first of all, I know you dislike this phrase, fake news. What is it, though? How would you define it? So the reason that I hate the term is that it doesn't actually helpfully describe what we're talking about. Most of the stuff that we see online isn't news at all. And so it's an unhelpful term. But also, as you just displayed, uh, it's been weaponized. It's being used as a way to undermine a free press. And it's being used very successfully. And in fact, audiences increasingly, when you ask them, what is the term, F asterisk asterisk news, they believe it's the mainstream media. So it's kind of astonishing <laughs> that we still keep using the term and that journalists use the term because you're kind of shooting yourselves in the foot. So, so what do you mean? Term. What do you mean? So we have to be much more careful. What are we talking about? So if it's misinformation, yes, it's false information, but the people sharing it don't mean any harm. So it might be my mum sharing a manipulated photo of a shark during a hurricane. That's misinformation. Disinformation is also false information, but shared with a specific aim to cause harm. But a lot of what we see are memes, visuals, images, videos, or propaganda, or lies, or distortions. We should use terms that actually describe what we're talking about, as opposed to this unhelpful term, which is not just unhelpful, it's actually weaponized, and now is increasingly damaging to a free press globally. So if we try and talk about disinformation as specifically as possible, Carl Miller, when you think about disinformation, what do you worry about? Uh, I worry about two things. I worry about politics and I worry about states. Now, disinformation, of course, is a particular deployment of uh, kind of wrongful facts um, to achieve a particular end. And that can either be within an election to kind of smear or undermine opponents, or it can be, and essentially this is what we're increasingly seeing, actually used by states in, as this strange new form of warfare. Um, around the world, really, over the last 10 years, um, military after military, like a stack of dominoes, have each redefined what warfare actually is. Um, they've rewritten their operational doctrines. Um, and each one has essentially put information at the heart. That's their kind of problem solving guide, really, these doctrines for how they think uh, war should be fought. Um, and each now, uh, whether it's a liberal democracy or, or an autocracy, um, has kind of pivoted their militaries towards fighting in this new information sphere, essentially kind of now seeing the kind of battle space extending all the way from a muddy battlefield all the way over to, to blogs and tweets and uh, the information swelling around on the internet. So that suggests that people are taking it seriously, perhaps that it has an impact. Uh, Susan McGregor, when you think about uh, disinformation, what do you worry about? 
Um, I think the thing that I worry about most is the damage that disinformation does to broader faith in institutions. So, I mean, we've seen, you know, disinformation, and as Claire points out, this term fake news used to uh, denigrate, you know, trust in the press. And I think that that is also seeping out into broader institutions where you have, um, you know, concerns being sowed about the validity of elections, about government institutions, corporate governance. Um, and to me, that signals a really uh, dangerous trend towards a general loss of faith in institutions, which which, you know, really are the backbone of any society. Right. All of this plenty that you're setting out that we can unpick as we go along. Um, Petras Austrovikas, what do you worry about when it comes to disinformation? I mean, from a political point of view, uh, uh, what I'm worried about is the uh, disinformation as uh, as a weaponized uh, tool, which is uh, used by state as well as non-state actors, uh, which deliberately uh, disseminate false information. If we see, I mean, the uh, uh, a huge flow of information uh, which is false, uh, so then let's ask uh, ourselves. I mean, democracy can only function properly if citizens are able to make informed decisions. They must be aware of the sources of information um, they base their decisions. In case uh, we see dis disinformation, fake news, uh, and uh, everything around, so then, well, uh, I raise a question. I mean, to what extent uh, the trust between media and citizens and well-informed citizens, uh, which are backbone of uh, democracy, well-functioning democracy, still uh, still in place? So that's why, uh, from my point of view, disinformation and fake news is increasingly threatens uh, democracies. And some uh, state and non-state actors knowing this, I mean, they employ more and more means, uh, resources and uh, creativity to, to follow this path. Well, we'll explore all of those ideas in more detail during the course of uh, this programme. But let's first of all hear from Dr. Kathleen Bailey. Now, from 1985 to 1987, she was a senior figure in the US State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research. And she was involved in combating something called Soviet active measures. And her story reveals how disinformation has long been a political tool. First of all, she explained what was meant by active measures. Active measures are a set of activities designed to influence foreign publics, things like disinformation, forgeries, front groups, agents of influence. And from your time in government, what was your experience of the Soviet Union using these kind of operations? Um, I came into a position where I was responsible for dealing with Soviet active measures in 1985. And at that time, the Moscow-run operation was in full swing with a whole host of activities ranging from trying to influence the U.S. relationship with its allies to causing disruption in American culture and society, primarily through use of front groups at the time and to some extent uh, disinformation campaigns in the media and forgeries from government officials and so forth. There is a really clear example about AIDS and the publishing of a report, essentially, that it was the US military that had created the AIDS virus. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, it all began with the Russian, then Soviets, putting an article in one of their newspapers in India called The Patriot. And it asserted that the United States was the origin of purposefully creating the AIDS virus. That story just kind of laid low for a number of years. And then the Moscow run operation picked it up and reproduced it in many newspapers, citing that original Patriot article. The fascinating thing about this is that it happened over quite a long period of time. The Soviets were willing to play a long game. The Soviets and the Russians play a very long game. What they do is uh, think about today, next year, and years hence about what they're trying to do and what will possibly play to publics for a long period of time. And they're very adept at this. They've been doing it for uh, years and years. And so, yes, it's a long game. It's a drip, drip game. But there would be those who would say that the U.S. might well be in, have been involved in similar activities. The U.S. may have done some activities somewhere, sometime. But let's face it, 
the Russians have a very large bureaucracy dedicated to influence and active measures activities. The United States has no counterpart. Their organization is almost the size of the whole U.S. State Department. We certainly do not have a budget, bureaucracy, or intellectual commitment to doing that kind of thing. Dr. Kathleen Bailey. Susan McGregor, she was talking about something that happened in the 80s, but that suggests that history is just repeating itself. What we're seeing now isn't that different. I think in some ways it isn't that different, but I think the the... What is different is the scale of the the sort of the scale of the activity and also um, the resources that are needed to implement it. I mean, she spoke about the vast infrastructure required to uh, create these kind of campaigns. And I think what technology has done, internet connected technologies have done, is they have really scaled down the level of investment, both human and monetary, required to execute um, you know a, a disinformation campaign. And so um, you know we see actually in the the U.S., we know that um, that domestic political campaigns do this, where they're creating what appear to be news websites years in advance of the campaign, you know, for the purpose of kind of, you know, we might say astroturfing uh, um, opinions about a certain topic in favor of a candidate or in favor of, an, you know, some a, a corporate interest. So I think the big difference is that whereas at one time you did need a, a massive infrastructure to implement these things effectively, today you can do it with really very f- relatively few people and a relatively small amount of money. And that makes it, uh, I think, uh, we have a risk of a much more pervasive problem and a much more difficult problem to root out. Petras Alstravikas, would you draw a line uh, from those sort of events in the 80s to where we are now? Well, we definitely see as the Cold War is over, but information war is never. And uh, I see a lot of uh, similarities probably from uh, 80s as... uh, Soviets, then uh, now Russians, uh, they still try to influence especially the close neighborhood uh, and uh, certain regions with uh, uh, kind of uh, new outreach uh, measures. Indeed, uh, I completely agree that, uh, I mean, those who try to to, uh, disseminate uh, disinformation, they never short of uh, funds as well as uh, means to do it. Uh, if previously it was more state-run uh, operations, I mean, state uh, TV, radio uh, of, uh, so in Soviet Union was uh, fully employed in, uh, in those operations. Now, I guess, I mean, they, they receive uh, a good backup from uh, so-called commercial uh, sources, uh, uh, like so-called independent uh, uh, information producers. And, and with this in mind, uh, what we, uh, I, I see a great difference uh, um, from uh, past uh, to today is that information become an important uh, tool in so-called hybrid threat uh, theory and practice. So here I see uh, a different scale of uh, danger uh, of today. And Carl Miller, it's impossible not to remember those uh, kids, largely children, teenagers, I should call them, uh, during the last American election in Macedonia, who were just making an awful lot of money, sticking up stories that then got circulated and they, they got revenue from advertising. Isn't that a big difference? Well, right. And this is the other story. I mean, at the moment, we've mainly been discussing, you know, and it's it is a real threat and there's lots to look at it. But um, we've been discussing kind of disinformation done by states. But there's there's a whole other um, kind of world of kind of for profit fake news or for profit clickbait. And yeah, the kind of Macedonian um, kind of community was the one that was uh, that kind of spotlighted um, during the last election. But I've just come back from Kosovo uh, myself interviewing some uh, kind of clickbait and fake news merchants just a few weeks ago um, with 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 a with a BBC program. Um, and it's still a pretty flourishing industry kind of um, which is probably actually also highly international. And you say it's still flourishing. Are they, have not have we not seen the imposition of checks and balances to stop this kind of thing as people have become more aware of it? So Facebook and the tech giants have all over this year um, pivoted to try and shut that industry down. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg has made it his kind of year long challenge to fight fake news. And it, I, I, what I saw when I was actually on the ground in, in Kosovo is that those reforms have had some effect. Um, I was there a year before, and, and certainly this time around, um, the industry is less profitable. 
Um, it's certainly less political too, uh, and and the kind of clickbait merchants who are simply trying to get clicks. They're not trying to cause a political outcome. They just want you to click on the content, and they don't care whether it's true or false content they're they're sharing with you to get those clicks. They're steering further away from from mm. politics than they have above before. So Claire Wardle money is one motivation, but what are the other motivations? Would you say for disseminating disinformation? So, yeah, so um, I talk about four different types, and we've talked about political and financial. We also have to think about social and psychological. So a big part of why this is a problem is that when people share content, they're trying to connect with other people. And so when we decide what we're going to share on Facebook or Twitter, we're thinking about who we're trying to connect with connect with, what's our worldview, what positions we're trying to take. And so there's a big social performative element of what we share. And I think sometimes we forget that. We tend to think as academics and journalists that people have a, a rational relationship with information. And actually, we have an emotional relationship with information. And the last category is psychological. I mean, we've just been monitoring disinformation in the lead up to the midterms. A lot of this is circulating on kind of anonymous web platforms like 4chan and 8chan and Discord. And in those spaces, they tend to be relatively young men who who are trying to connect one another and just kind of cause trouble for the sake of causing trouble and seeing what they can achieve. And so that's an, another element of this that we need to understand. So this social and psychological element is, is more about the dissemination part of it. So financial and political is why people create it in the first place, but social and psychological is why it disseminates at speed through these networks. And obviously technology is, is allowing this to go faster and faster. But what about the amplification that comes with that? Claire, what, why does that matter? So what's fascinating, actually, about when we look at historical patterns is what they were attempting to do was to seed these kind of stories in the mainstream media because they understood that that was where the megaphone lay. And the same is the case now, is that we see these kind of campaigns being honed in these anonymous spaces, pushed into places like Twitter, YouTube and Facebook, knowing that journalists will probably then find it in those spaces and then talk about it. And that's what we need to understand is that, in, unfortunately, the mainstream media is now vulnerable through these campaigns to essentially be the last stage of the amplification model. And increasingly, I don't think journalists recognise how vulnerable they are. Susan McGregor, do you think journalists are actually a little bit naive about how this uh, environment is changing? Well, I think that uh, on the surface, of course, you know, journalists are very aware of, you know, the, the various things that are out there that are trying to influence them. At the same time, I think, um, to a point that was made earlier, that there's sort of a seed of truth. I mean, in the United States, for example, we've seen, you know, multiple incidents, very legitimate news in incidents that weren't getting a lot of coverage um, until they did kind of get attention on social media. And those turned out to be really important um, issues. And so I think there is a little bit of uncertainty um, sometimes as to to whether you know there's any there there and so you do get these these um these campaigns that do successfully kind of infiltrate the mainstream in part because it is difficult to know whether something is legitimate but also because there are times when you know established news organizations have effectively been wrong in the past and so um, i think that that makes it even trickier um, even if your gut says no or your research says you know this is just something people are talking about on an anonymous chat form and there's nothing to it, um, I think, you know, journalists are inherently skeptical and so um, continue to pursue things to be sure. And sometimes that winds up with the wrong things making it, you know, into mainstream coverage. And uh, the other way of looking at that is perhaps as journalism has suffered the pressures of a changing landscape, people are under pressure to do things more quickly and perhaps don't check enough. That's absolutely the case, is that unfortunately <laughs> now when the audience can see the same information on social media and now a scoop might last two minutes, if that, um, in that environment, of course, um, newsrooms are under increasing pressure at a time when lots of newsrooms have lost money and resources and lost staff, um, you know, lost fact checkers. So that's what has also made newsrooms more vulnerable. We've talked about social media, but I also want to mention closed groups, which are becoming increasingly popular. People are moving off things like Facebook and actually they're getting on to encrypted messaging apps like WhatsApp. How are these being used in political campaigns? Carl Miller. Um, well, uh, the, 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 there's been a number of uh, political campaigns across Africa recently where WhatsApp has been kind of signalled as being actually the key disseminator of news, um, essentially uh, maximising the total number of people that you, you have in them and, and Telegram as well. 
Um, it, certainly in countries also where there are reasonably kind of closed regimes, um, where Twitter or Facebook are not uh, immediately accessible, um, these closed groups with end-to-end -end encryption have become have kind of taken on that kind of quasi-public role. They've become almost a kind of closed but also open public forum. Um, and within these closed groups, you know, there's lots of information being shared about politics, about politicians, and, and misinformation uh, and disinformation too. Um, it can make it even more difficult to actually shut down um, for two reasons. Firstly, transparency is actually useful, and, and around the world increasingly, journalists are actually flagging up and taking on and rebutting and reporting on misinformation that they encounter, and that is probably having a good effect. Petrus, um, Petrus Alshavikis, I don't want to put you on the on the spot, but yes. I dare say as a politician, you're a, a member of a, of a closed group, as am I as a journalist. Uh, these things are being used widely. Should we be more worried about them? Well, I mean, politicians have really used them to, to be in a closed groups, uh, I can tell you that, uh, I mean, uh, during our discussions, uh, debates and uh, present in, uh, in the European Parliament uh, in particular, I mean, everybody's on a smart, uh, smartphone, I mean, uh, uh, at every instance. I mean, it doesn't matter what kind of the stage uh, of debate you are in. I mean, um, news are coming uh, and going, uh, and we produce uh, a lot of sometimes not uh, complete uh, um, uh, news um, since, I mean, we are... Um, sending it uh, every uh, every moment but uh, well uh, you know i mean we are uh, attached uh, each and every to our uh, um, citizens to, our uh, to uh, yeah, indeed uh, those who uh, our followers and you receive um, a response uh, from them uh, very quickly you can uh, in fact, measure your uh, quality um, information uh, you produce. So that's why uh, it's up to you, uh, very much up to a politician. Of course, I mean, uh, some outreach uh, effect is uh, much bigger and, uh, uh, well, macro level, um, you know, influence indeed is, is increasingly important. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, in the European Parliament, we have uh, Mr. Farage, for example, and uh, his uh, tweets uh, are of different uh, substance, probably even being in, in the same uh, meeting room as, as mine. So that's why, I mean, different uh, pieces of information are coming from uh, those closed uh, groups at the same time. Claire Wardle, you took on, I think, this idea of, of citizen journalism. You kind of tried to use it to tackle the power of these closed groups. So, so we just did a big project in Brazil and there's a huge WhatsApp usage in Brazil. And in the election, Bolsonaro, who just won, was very effective in creating lots of WhatsApp groups and spreading disinformation. So we created a coalition of 24 Brazilian newsrooms who were working together to find and debunk this. And we had uh, 70,000 messages in from the Brazilian public of things they were seeing on WhatsApp that they wanted to have debunked. So um, we're trying to find ways that we can actually take on that because but as it's given encrypted, that we can't Bolsonaro see. won, did, did your effort work so <laughs> yes i think if we judged all of our projects on uh, who wins i mean i'd say we uh, we're in the process of evaluating it but the level of concern amongst brazilians about the problem on whatsapp i think we definitely reached people who didn't recognize that the things that they were seeing were false and they were able to share those debunks with friends and families in these groups because that's what makes the uh, whatsapp so concerning is that it's not a social media it's actually people in small groups the average size of a whatsapp group is six and the people that you tend to be in those groups with are people are your friends families co-workers so when you find a piece of information there, you've got no other heuristics, no other mental shortcuts to help you make sense of the information other than the fact that it's from your best friend, Martha. And if that's the case, you're much more likely to think that it's true. So that's another layer that we have with WhatsApp that's problematic. The, the, sorry, Richard, there is a bit of a danger around um, kind of overregging the possible impact of, of fake news or disinformation and, and kind of seeing that that's the reason why Trump or Duarte or Bolsonaro have actually been elected, which can be a bit of a red herring as well. Because, They're I mean, just I, is a way to look at it. Well, I, I, voted for them. I, I think it's quite easy for, for liberals to essentially see the rising of these politicians as essentially being the, the product of a, of a populace being duped or fooled into voting for them, which I think actually misses the kind of quite profound social and economic forces which are, which are currently sweeping a whole new kind of politician into power. Indeed. Noted in a separate discussion, but I totally <laughs> see what you're saying. Uh, one other kind of aspect of this that's emerging at the moment is this idea of deep fake videos and AI. Uh, Susan McGregor, what, how much should we worry about a deep fake video and just give us a sense of what we're talking about here? 
Well, so deep fake refers to the idea of creating videos that are video content that is believably uh, presented as someone saying or doing something they didn't. So um, some really prominent examples have circulated online, um, pres you know, video of President Obama saying things that we would never expect him to say. Um, and the reality is that the, the technology in this space, the research technology, is, is actually pretty good. Um, and it is uh, something that can be done in essentially real time. Uh, which means that I can have a video feed of someone airing and I can have an actor sitting there essentially projecting uh, words into that into the, the mouth of the person who's speaking um, you know is the quality amazing at this point no on the other hand I would point out that most of the time when people are consuming this material you know they're not sitting in front of a, a high definition big screen you know one you know scrutinizing it for whether or not it's real right most of the time we're seeing these you know on small scale possibly low resolution connections um, you know while we're in the middle of doing something else and as we know uh, you know we're all uh, subject to confirmation bias when it comes to the material that we view. And so I think there is a pretty big risk um, of, you know, again, the issue being here that the technology no longer reserved for people with, uh, for groups with a lot of resources is something that really could proliferate uh, quite quickly. And, you know, mm. Uh, as Claire mentioned before, you know, Photoshop has been around for decades and we still get fooled by fake video, yep. you know, fake photos when they circulate on social media during, you know, times of, of crisis. Okay. So I think there is I think there is a risk there that, um, you know, we just we need to also be savvy to these emerging issues. Hold that thought. We have to take a short break now. Thank you to our panel for now. Susan McGregor, Carl Miller, Petra Saustravikas and Claire Wardle. To remind you, do let us know what you think of the programme or any ideas for topics you'd like us to look into. You can email us at therealstory at bbc.co.uk or tweet me at Rittler. And if you enjoy the programme, we have a podcast you can subscribe to. Just search for BBC The Real Story in your podcast app. You're listening to The Real Story from the BBC World Service with me, Rithula Shah. This week, we're asking if the rapid spread of distorted facts and baseless lies, so-called fake news, is corroding trust and damaging democracy. We're joined by Petras Autravikas, who's a member of the European Parliament, Carl Miller from the think tank Demos, Susan McGregor from the Columbia School of Journalism in New York, and Claire Wardle, Executive Director of First Draft, which is dedicated to finding solutions to the challenges associated with trust and truth in the digital age. Now, earlier in the programme, we tried to grapple with the nature of the problem, what it is that is that makes up this idea of fake news and what's behind it. But I now really want to think about solutions. Back in April of this year, the Facebook founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg was summoned to hearings at the US Congress. Now, he appeared before lawmakers for the first time to answer questions about how his social networking company handles its 2.2 billion users' private data, as well as the role the company had played in Russia's meddling in the 2016 election. Here he is explaining what measures the company has taken. So we've deployed new AI tools uh, that do a better job of identifying fake accounts that may be trying to interfere in elections or spread misinformation. And between those three elections, we were able to proactively remove tens of thousands of accounts that before they, they could um, contribute significant harm. And the nature of these attacks, though, is that you know, there are people in Russia whose job it is is to try to exploit our systems and other internet systems and other systems as well. So this is an arms race. I mean, they're going to keep on getting better at this, and we need to invest in keeping on getting better at this too, which is why uh, one of the things I mentioned before is we're going to have uh, more than 20,000 people by the end of this year working on security and content review across the company. Mark Zuckerberg describing what his company's doing to combat disinformation. Susan McGregor, should we be relying on the companies to do this themselves? 
no. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it would be nice to to hedge on that. But no, I, I mean, I think, you know, realistically, uh, you know, I mean, Facebook, unfortunately, is is um, sort of one of the worst offenders in this where, you know, each time something, you know, each time they're sort of exposed, um, you know, that something something negative has been circulating on their platform, they sort of come out and do this this public tour where they say, oh, we're sorry, we're going to fix it, we're going to do better. Um, and realistically, we don't see um, a lot of improvement. I don't think it's beyond the capacity capacity, um, certainly given the fact that, you know, the thing that isn't mentioned is that, you know, these networks are actually populated by a lot of real people um, who do a ton of reporting about this content. And, um, you know, it's not clear how that reporting is handled, whether it's, you know, how, how seriously it's treated by the platforms. It's definitely possible to do better. Um, but I think, you know, the reality is that these companies are hugely profitable operating the way that they are. Um, there was a huge piece in the New York Times yesterday um, that really detailed, uh, you know, the strategies that have been deployed by Facebook in particular to try to um, sidestep, you know, the possibility of regulation. And I think and I, we've reached a point where that's inevitable. And I should say that we asked both Facebook and Google for interviews, but uh, they didn't <laughs> want to, to come to the come to the party. Uh, regulation, though, it's a very rapidly changing environment. Claire Wardle, is that something that you think is even possible? Well, we've seen a number of pieces of regulation passed globally, many of which are very disturbing and worrying. And part of the reason is going back to that definition question that we started with, is that if we can't be clear about what we mean by this, we shouldn't be having regulation to try and stop it. And so one of the things that we say is we have almost no research on this, partly because the data is wrapped up by the companies themselves and they refuse to release it. So when we have this question about how much is this type of information impacting society, we don't really know. And so this question of, you know, what should we be taking down? There's a real concern here that if we find the platforms, there's going to be a chilling effect and they will actually overcompensate and will have real implications in terms of free expression. The current situation is not one that we want to be in, but I would argue that we need to put more pressure on the platforms to open up but the data. But they're not going to hand can... over their data. That's their money making model. It's, it's their trade secret, if you like. Uh, yes, but they need to be forced to do so. And in terms of the impact of algorithms, which are entirely opaque, you know, with financial markets, there's regulation. There are ways and means to have trusted well, agents who can do this kind of analysis. And if we don't do that, then we are. it's really problematic to think about regulation when we don't understand what we're trying to regulate. Petras, you're the one with some power. Are you going to go in and regulate? Well, I, I deeply believe in uh, better self-regulation. Self-regulation. Uh, self-regulation, indeed. And online media uh, has a, a huge potential. I mean, to improve um, in, in this uh, in, 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 in this regard, uh, I appreciate. I mean, the recent information uh, spread around as uh, Facebook has removed uh, around 600 million fake accounts during the last six months. I think it's it's a great move. Uh, should be followed by more means and. Uh, 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 better uh, self-regulation, as well as uh, speaking about uh, journalism. Uh, well, journalists are indeed uh, responsible for spreading lots of information, and I'm a I'm strong believer in uh, self-regulation uh, uh, of, um, of journalists, uh, of uh, the community of uh, journalists uh, should respond uh, properly in, in this regard. But let's be frank, uh, it's, it's an important but one of the means uh, which might improve uh, the quality of information. Susan McGregor, self-regulation is still being advocated there. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that, I mean, th there are a number of differences between the way that the platforms operate and the way that, you know, traditional news publishers operate. The key one, at least in the United States, is liability. If a publisher publishes something that is false, they are legally liable in the United States and can be sued and will suffer financially. At the moment, that is not at all true for these platforms. So, you know, again, it, the, the, the fact is that without some sort of financial incentive without some sort of um, without some sort of regulation or liability for the material that they're disseminating um, you know there's no reason other than public relations issues for them to not continue in business as usual and you know we've seen the devastating consequences that that has I mean we all are very aware now of the situation in Myanmar and that was something that the company had been informed about for years before taking any action on it what so, do you mean that the idea that there was a, that Facebook was being used to disseminate particular points of view 
Uh, the, I mean, and and I mean, the UN has implicated Facebook in the what is now being termed a genocide of the Rohingya in in Myanmar, and so I think you know the the fact is that national non governmental organizations had been flagging these issues to the company for several years before they took any action. And, um, you know, I think that just shows us that unless it's made, you know, unless they suffer for it, you know, unless the company is going to suffer for it, we can't trust them to self-regulate. But Carl Miller, when you think about the model on which these big companies operate, it is about attracting us to their product and keeping us there. That is necessarily going to mean that there's a certain kind of product, uh, certain kind of article, certain kind of content that is going to fulfill, if you like, that ambition, that very basic uh, basic structure on which they are founded and on which they succeed. That's right, kind of whole, uh, gore and, and horrifying stories and things like that. It is, it's those kind of, that, that kind of content that floats to the top. Um, and, and, and of course, that's the kind of content which historically uh, tech giants have, 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 have wanted to serve up to people. I would just like to, in part, ride to the defence of Facebook here, at least in the context of Kosovo. Actually speaking to um, kind of fake news merchants on the ground, it was, it was clear that actually Facebook's reforms really have had an effect. You can, it's almost impossible to hear a good news story about the tech giants at the moment, um, but, but, but sometimes they, they, they do actually act proactively. And, and definitely over the last year, two things can be said. One is that clickbait for profit has become less profitable and two clickbait for profit has become less political and if anything i think the the big worry that, that i saw was that they've overreacted and if in fact shut down lots of groups across the balkans that were sharing content which had nothing to do with with fake news um but were simply getting lots of western clicks so they were kind of wielding this sledgehammer um and not necessarily hitting all the right places and that's the other worry here is that as they kind of get dragged in front of congressional committees and parliamentary select committees and become more and more embarrassed about this, um, they actually kind of um, target and almost remove the right of people to publish from areas that are far less able to complain about it, people like those that live in Kosovo. Petras, would that be a more helpful place perhaps for regulators to operate in? What are, what are the acceptable parameters within which everybody can operate? Well, uh, well, besides the self-regulation, self uh, uh, I agree. I mean, um, uh, um, regulation on the national level should be used as well. Um, for example, we should quote uh, a good, uh, good practice employed by, by Germany recently. Uh, they have increased um, um, fiscal penalties uh, for, uh, against those who disseminate uh, um, fake, uh, fake news and, um, um, and even propaganda. And, and, and we had many examples um, recently in, in German press, um, media um, on, on, in this regard. Again, um, well, speaking about the regulation, you know, in Lithuania we had um, a couple of cases when uh, once the, uh, our broadcasting um, commission, independent commission, had to um, shut down uh, the, some Russian uh, channels uh, who have been accused of uh, dissemination of um, even information which uh, goes against uh, uh, basic human rights uh, and, and, uh, and European values. And uh, that was proved by experts, and licenses were uh, temporarily suspended. So even that, I think, uh, should be used sometimes when, uh, when you see it as a um, uh, final end. Susan, does that, in a sense, illustrate the point, though, that almost no one can agree about how we, we attack this beast, as it were? Right. I mean, I think what we're all saying is that is that, you know, they need to do a better job. Right. We don't want them to be you know, we don't want these platforms to be too permissive and we don't want them to be too restrictive. But what that does require is that, you know, societies take on the job of saying this is what we think is appropriate. Yeah. This is how we think it should be done. And then communicate that to the companies via regulation. I mean, if we don't do that, we are leaving it up to, you know, these tiny leaderships, you know, of these companies to make those decisions. And, you know, as I say, their their gut instincts, but, you know, what we see of their instincts over the last several years have not been great. But Carl Miller, how easy is it going to be to do that? If you think about GDPR, which is this rule introduced by the European Union to do with data protection, it's been enormously controversial. Uh, the Americans don't like it at all. Enormously controversial and, and any regulation which seeks to define truth or falsehood by a government enforced by some kind of governmental or statutory body is going to be an absolute political firestorm. Um, there's, there's, there's a good reason why the press um, don't have a royal charter in the UK and that's because um, 
we've we've long resisted the idea that government should be dictating um, basic journalistic standards. Um, and you know, I I I do agree. At the mo at the moment, we we have politically embarrassed the tech giants into themselves having to make discriminations on a huge basis about what they regard to be true or not true, or likely to be true or not likely to be true. That is untenable. It simply is untenable that private companies are making those kind of decisions with enormous socio cultural con consequences for all of us. Um, but but states stepping in more is something which which I think, especially when it comes to the press, is something that that so many people feel very wary about. Um, I don't think we have the right solution yet. To be perfectly honest with you, I don't think we have the right tool on the table. I, I, but I don't think regulation is, is, is the right shaped tool for this problem. Well, let's talk about some of the other tools that are out there. For instance, we've talked about there's projects going on kite marking. There's something called the Trust Project, which is an international consortium of news organisations that they say are building standards of transparency and working with the tech firms. Is this the kind of thing that has to work, Claire Wardle? So I would say that we're all having these conversations about what's the solution. And I would say this is one of the trickiest problems that we've faced in human history. And that, A, we're not going to see any real shift on this, I don't think, for at least 20 years. And it's going to take, it's a multi-pronged effort by a mixture of government, civil society researchers, the tech platforms themselves. Um, and so I think when we say what's the solution, part of this is going to be technology. And so some of these initiatives are around giving signals to algorithms to actually promote trusted content and demote, you know, fact checkers are con at the moment demoting content on Facebook's algorithm. So we've got some of that. We've got a lot of media literacy efforts happening. We've got a number of different civil society on the ground effort. So I think at the moment we're kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall and we need to actually evaluate all of those efforts and just slow down and say, I know we all want this to go away. But truthfully, it didn't start the day that Trump was elected. That was a day we all started using the term. But actually, this problem has been around for a long time and it's we're not going to see any significant change for well, some decades. Is another way of looking at this then, Susan McGregor, that we're all just wildly overreacting. This is a spike that simply comes with new technology and when we all get used to the technology and, and become a little bit less naive, it'll settle down again. I think there's some of that, certainly. I mean, I think that, um, you know, that the, that the there isn't a, a ton of organization about the way that these things are operating. But I will say that, you know, something that has occurred to me lately about this issue is that, you know, what we're seeing is networked information. And in, in computer networking, we have this idea of something called a Sybil attack, which basically says that, um, you know, if the nodes of a network, in this case, the nodes would be the producers of, of content or information, if enough of them are bad, you have a bad network. Um, and, you know, we absolutely, you know, journalists and journalistic organizations, I think, are putting a lot of effort into uh, creating, you know, uh, better content. There's fact checking efforts. There are these civil society efforts. But you have to be able to flag on some level um, the credibility of what is um, of what is being presented. And some of this, I think, actually could be quite rudimentary. Right. I mean, it could be as you know, you could just go to the point of saying, you know, you have to know where this is coming from, who paid for well, it, you know, those kinds of things. Well, I was going to advocate, isn't it time that we just said to everybody, come on, you all, what you all need is a healthy dose of scepticism. Sure, you need scepticism, but, you know, I would also point out that, you know... <laughs> We, we've actually evolved over the course of a century or so um, a profession that is built for dealing with this kind of thing, and that's professional journalism, right? The average person has other things to do. They don't have the time to do all the fact-checking and do all the, the, the finding out about this. And so, sure, you can be skeptical, but I'd say that's actually, in a way, what we have right now is we have, by and large, uh, you know, populations that are getting a ton of information. They don't have the right cues for determining what's valid and what's not or what's um, you know, honest and what's not. And so, um, you know, we're getting these sort of wildly disparate, in some cases, perceptions of reality. So, you know, it's, it is, journalism is the profession that has evolved to deal with this. Um, but right now, that activity is largely drowned out by these other efforts, whether they be misinformation, disinformation, you know, or as you point out, you know, teenagers looking to, to make some money. Carl Miller, why don't facts work? Why doesn't just constantly shouting about what you believe to be a fact why doesn't that seem to make any impact <laughs> well as, as, it's a great question i mean 
Uh, as has already been pointed out, really, we, we, we don't have this kind of rational actor way of engaging with information. We, we share and because we feel, not because we think. Time and again, when I mean, the people that know this best are actually the viral ad advertising agencies. They've long known that what makes people share content isn't to convince them, it's to pluck one of those primordial psychological strings that we have. You know, that something's really cute, that something's really funny, that something's really horrifying or shocking. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, qu quite often, you know, falsehoods really are, are, are kind of trotting around the world before anyone's really began to rationally engage with them at all. Um, I completely agree with, with my fellow panelists around this being a decades long issue. I mean, what we're essentially living through, in my view, is just the decline of the kind of monopoly of publishing that journalism and professional journalists have held. And as lots of people join the party, uh, it's, it's pretty inevitable that the kind of qualities of information they're bringing with them are going to be much broader too. So democratisation of journalism and information might actually possibly undermine democracy itself. Petras, do, do you... See, think, believe that we have decades in which to play this out? Well, I think we, we should rely on quality uh, quality journalism, and I believe in uh, in this profit so much. But, but if people aren't reading quality journalism, they're just looking at what's popping up on their phone. Indeed, and, and they have a choice, and they should have a choice, I mean, to choose uh, whatever they wish. Uh, so that's why, on one side, I think we should uh, um, continuously improve uh, education and media literacy. I completely agree with... Uh, um, 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 my fellows, Claire. but uh, again, uh, look. Um, sometimes uh, disinformation is not just uh, you know, um, an, uh, just a game. Um, well, look um, deeper into in, into something. What uh, leads, for example, not just uh, non-state uh, actors, but state actors. I mean, to influence uh, the societies uh, around. I mean, uh, domestic uh, domestic societies or international ones. Uh, I think we should uh, continue to develop greater resilience and a kind of ability to respond to threats in the real time. So, well, do, do you think within the European Union there's enough of a, enough action being taken in that sphere? Is it taken seriously? Well, I think we are catching up. Uh, I, I will present you one, one example. In uh, 2016, once uh, we, we have produced this report in the European Parliament, you can't uh, imagine what kind of a resistance uh, we met. Uh, there was a, uh, a general call and a general opinion that, look, we are going to intervene something uh, of the self-regulation. It's, it's like uh, a free market, uh, you know, I mean, um, play and... Um, I mean, those politicians uh, try to, to regulate and, uh, and to bring some barriers uh, for um, free flow of information. But uh, with the uh, Brexit uh, referenda, with the U.S. Um, elections, we saw that, look, I mean, uh, we are probably should describe the situation a bit better uh, uh, under the modern, I would say, um, circumstances. So that's why now I think we, we, uh, we see... Um, Better, uh, much better uh, preparedness from uh, from the EU side to respond to, to disinformation. Susan McGregor, you're the first person, I think, that, that brought up this idea of it taking decades to resolve this as an issue. Well, does democracy have decades? Does it have the time for the EU to wake up and recognise this is a problem? Well, I mean, I think, as, as Claire mentioned, yeah, it is going to take decades. And... Um, you know, do we have those decades? I don't I'm, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, certainly there are many of us who are disturbed by what seems like, auto, you know, what seem like autocratic trends around the world. Um, and I think if you look at those societies, um, you know, what we see, you know, just to acknowledge that we see where national legislation um, is used as a, you know, is used as a hammer uh, against dissent um, and the kind of expression that many of us would like to see supported. Um, I think that there, but I, but I don't, I don't think it's necessarily too late. I mean, you know, the GDPR as an example, um, you know, really actually leaves, you know, has an exception, for example, for journalistic activities, um, and I think does a, does a good job of targeting the things that um, are really key to this, which is that it, it targets the data and it targets the data collection that is actually the money maker in all of this, right? But, but I mean, I was only using that as an example of, of mm. a regulation that, in and of itself, caused. So so much concern and opposition amongst parties that were affected by it. 
Of course. But I mean, I think, you know, they're they, I mean, it depends on who the parties are. If the parties are the companies, um, you know, that's not surprising. I think we need to be also concerned, you know, here in the United States, uh, you know, um, the Pew Research Center does surveys regularly about the attitudes of the American public. And overwhelmingly, the American public is unhappy with data collection practices. So um, if you start to if you start to to uh, turn off that hose, um, then I think you're going to see a shift from these companies because their business model is going to have to change. But when we come back to the idea of the impact of all of this on democracy and the democratic model, are established open societies like the United States, like Europe, better equipped to battle against disinformation, or actually are, are they? just as as baffled and as ill-equipped i think they're i think they're better equipped because the um you know the openness you know the pre-existing openness of the intellectual activity um you know means that there are more people interested in working on solutions right so i mean ultimately you know the the, the freedoms that we enjoy are among other things, what allow research to happen that helps find, you know, helps explore solutions to these problems. So, you know, are those things commercially available right now? Perhaps not. But, um, you know, there are a large number of interested parties who are really um, activating around these things and who will, I, I think, ultimately come up with, you know, with some good solutions. Carl Miller, what do you think of the differences in terms of, of defending democratic processes between societies that are relatively open and societies that are not? Oh, I think Western societies are far better able to defend against this. We, we, the, the tech platforms are from the West. We have, we have strong journalistic traditions. Um, most people really do still read and believe and trust journalists of one kind or another. Um, we're far less able to do it, however. And, and um, you know, I think, I think we sometimes forget that, that most of what we would call information warfare or disinformation is actually autocratic governments angling at their own citizens. Um, most of the tweets that Twitter's released that they know are related to Russian information warfare were in Russian, and they were targeting people within Russia. Likewise, most of uh, the Chinese apparatus for manipulating um, the information sphere is, is, is about domestic control. It's not about foreign policy. Um, but, um, yeah, so I, I, th I think Western countries do do less of this as a kind of tool of foreign policy than autocracies. Um, but we're, we're far better able to defend it when, it when it happens to us. But when you have a situation which is one that we're seeing in many countries around the world where politics is very divided, are those divisions simply being entrenched by people existing within an echo chamber and therefore, it doesn't matter whether it's truth or lies that you're hearing. Yeah, and that's a kind of look. I mean, we, we've all been worrying about definitions of fake news and how it essentially bundles together quite a lot of different things all at once. And and there's another kind of grey area definition, which is about the kind of selective emission of truth. You know, and and this is often kind of at the sides of kind of hyper-partisan journalistic outlets that that are not outwardly lying. They're just kind of being they're just carefully selecting and cherry picking a series of truths to wrap together into what then appears and ends up being quite a distorted view of the world that's a massive worry to me i, I think that that's actually far more insidious much harder to debunk um than a lot of the kind of outright reasonably crude kind of kind of lies and misinformation disinformation which which we often dwell on when we're looking for examples of this kind of stuff claire wardle I could not agree more. We've just been monitoring exactly this type of content in Brazil and the US, and it's all hyper-partisan, misleading content. And a lot of it has kernels of truth, and it relies on people's emotions. I think, to go back to Carl's point earlier, what we're not talking about in this conversation is that many communities now are incredibly fearful of these huge societal changes, whether that's global migration, rise of automation, which means they're worried for their jobs, the fact that technology has changed everything, um, the impact of the 2008 financial crash. I mean, all of this means that people are frightened. And so when you layer on top of that fear, this kind of emotional content that's driven by uh, people's fears and worries, that's why this content is so effective. But to Carl's point, when you go through it, you can't debunk this. This is just really relying on people's emotions. And the people who are the most successful in this space know exactly what they need to do. And so it's content that makes you uh, scared and frightened. And that's what you share with your friends and family because you want to protect them. And I think we just don't talk enough about that. But then what flows from that is that it's a very particular kind of politician that will succeed. 
Absolutely. I mean, when we look globally at the rise of populist leaders, it's because our communities are becoming increasingly divided. And a lot of that is around social issues that we're not really dealing with. And so people like Trump and Bolsonaro and Duterte come into those spaces and say, we know you don't trust institutions. We are different. So it's exactly to Susan's point at the beginning. When trust in institutions is declining, it allows people who come in and the only thing that their platform is, which says, I'm different. Petras, so, where does that leave? Where does that leave you in your school of politics? Then are you going to have to change the way you operate? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, look, um, I'm a strong believer in um, in open societies, and uh, indeed, uh, I completely agree with uh, previous comments uh, that open societies are better uh, better exposed to fight the fake news uh, rather than the closed uh, societies or um, countries uh, which are under very centralized control. Uh, uh, information-wise. Um, why it is? Because we, uh, open societies have uh, uh, a clear choice. I mean, they can choose uh, different uh, sources of information. They can check uh, and, uh, and, and, and still people uh, with a critical thinking, uh, they, they, they do compare sources and uh, uh, not probably the best uh, fact checkers, but still, <laughs> I mean, much better than uh, provided by one source. So that's why I don't think we, we, we should uh, change our Mm, policy line completely. Probably we should adapt to changing uh, um, social media and um, technologies better. So in the last minute that we've got left, if each of you were to suggest a way we could all inoculate ourselves, in a sense, from being uh, hoodwinked by disinformation, what would your sort of piece of advice be, Petras? Well, we, we should take it seriously. Uh, it's not uh, fake news. Is not a fake news. Uh, it's real. Um, it uh, really um, makes an impact of, uh, on uh, uh, our behavior, uh, and especially democratic societies. Uh, they should not uh, neglect uh, the uh, information warfare, which comes from not really friendly countries to the Western uh, okay. uh, Western life. Susan. I would say um, read real journalism and uh, and think before before you're sharing. I mean, as an individual, I think we do skepticism does have a role to play. Um, but yeah, just being careful with what you yourself consume and what you share. Carl Miller. Uh, let's fund uh, librarians out of the national security budget and start seeing uh, digital <laughs> literacy of citizens as being a question of national security. Claire Wardle. Yes, to agree with Susan, I wish that all the platforms would have a button and you can't click share until you've actually thought about something for two minutes. Read, think, and then press like, send, share. Thank you very much, Claire Wardle, Susan McGregor, Carl Miller, Petras Ashravikas. Uh, thank you all for joining in. That's it for this edition of The Real Story. Do join us next week when I hopefully I'll have the end of the script, which I've lost, and I will find it in a minute and just end that. Thank you all very much. Just stay with me. Bear with me for a minute because I've just lost the very last page. That's it for this week on The Real Story. Thank you very much to all of our guests, Petras Archivikas, Carl Miller, Susan McGregor and Claire Wardle. If you'd like to listen to this programme again or any other from the archive, you can listen back online by searching for BBC The Real Story. If you like this week's programme, make sure you never miss another edition and subscribe to our podcast. You can find us simply by searching for The Real Story in your podcast app. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on the programme. Email us, therealstory at bbc.co.uk or tweet me at Ritala. From me, Ritala Shah and the whole team, that is The Real Story for this week. Thank you for listening. Listening. Thank you so much. Apart from that little, uh, I've got loads of papers in front of me and I couldn't find the right one. Thank you all very much indeed. Very much, and uh, yeah, th thanks for the time and it was a great chat. Thanks yeah, a really lot. Enjoyed it. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.